me begin. Well, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome Professor Jonathan Cole today for giving a lecture of, on uh, Clapham Science Stretch Sensitive Facial Muscle Contraction After Complete Denervation. Professor Cole is a chair of clinical neurophysiology in the UK and for several years now president of the European chapter of clinical neurophysiology. Jonathan, please. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, today I'm going to present a slightly unusual thing, a new finding that came to me via a physiotherapist called Lorraine Clapham, and which we subsequently have called Clapham Sign. And this appears to be a facial mus muscle which is completely denervated, contracting after stretch. And I did it with uh, my co-workers, Drs. Allen and Arenchalan. I have no disclosures. We'll begin by discussing neurogenic muscle cramp which you'll know are sudden, painful, involuntary contractions of a muscle or part of it, which are accompanied by periodic bursts of high-frequency discharges, and it shows a variable propagation within the muscle. There has been controversy as to whether this is a central phenomenon, which Obi et al. suggested, because they could find no cramps after a proximal ulnar nerve block, or whether it's peripheral, and it was found to be present after several nerve blocks by Ed Lambert, as well as Bertolese's group. The question remains, though, as to whether cramps arise because of abnormal excitation in terminal branches of motor neurons, or because of hyperexcitability of axons, or because of hyperexcitability in muscle fibers themselves. In some very interesting research, Roloveld et al recorded multiple channels from soleus muscle and gastrocnemius during physiological cramps or cramps that the patients had. And they claimed that the cramps that they recorded with these multiple electrodes arose at or close to the muscle fiber itself. You'll remember this when we come on to discuss pattern signs. Now, the plan of the lecture is to begin by giving the clinical observation which Lorraine Clapham made in relation to her facial rehabilitation, to give evidence from four patients of the phenomenon, to give EMG recording from face, facial muscle after stretch, and then we will speculate on the origin of Clapham's sign and its possible significance. Her first observation arose when she was looking after people who have severe facial nerve paralysis. You will know that sometimes they have unwanted synkinesis, and the aim of facial therapy is to try to reduce the synkinesis, but also at the time to teach patients about their oral hygiene. It's easy to have food caught inside the cheek when you can't move it, and therefore the physiotherapist would use their index finger to remove food debris by placing the hand inside a glove finger and then stroking or stretching the patient's cheek. Lorraine Clapham noticed that some patients who had complete facial nerve palsy showed a prolonged facial spasm after palpation and stretch of the cheek on the affected side. She came to me to ask what might be going on and thought it could be a reflex. But of course, there was no reflex possible because the muscle was completely denervated. So another explanation had to be found. We saw four further cases of the same thing, which are discussed here. One with post ramsey hunt syndrome, two acoustic neuromas, where we know that there's complete surgical sacrifice of the seventh nerve, and one, a man who had a severe post-crush injury to the head and skull base, leading to complete clinical paralysis in the sixth and seventh cranial nerve territory. All of them have a Hausdorff back score of six, the most severe for facial palsy. Now it's quite important to understand how to elicit clapping signs, and for this you should not be 
too gentle in the manner that physiotherapists are aware of. They suggest to use gloves moistened with water because a dry glove in the mouth is not pleasant. And of course, you explain to the patient what you're going to do and ask them to relax and open their mouth wide. And it's quite useful to do the stretch on the unaffected side first, to put them at ease with what's going to be happening. And then with a slow sweeping motion, the inside of the cheek is swept top to bottom twice, going from the back of the cheek to the front. So going from the back over here to the front, and we do it twice. You'll see this on a video a bit later. During the focal sweep, you may see this quite severe stretching of the cheek muscle itself. And then you take the finger out of the mouth. And of course, the patient wants to tell you about what's happened, but you ask them not to do that because it will affect the response. So it's worth reminding people as you take the finger out that they're not to talk because you want to see what's happening. Here are the cases in which it's demonstrated. Case two, a lady of 56 had a right acoustic neuroma with sacrifice of the seventh nerve. And this is two months later. Before the finger sweep, you see the angle of the mouth going down on the right. And I hope you can see that post the finger sweep, the angle of the mouth is far more horizontal. And there's some contraction around the edge of the mouth here. 11 months later, six months after an anastomosis, he was able to produce some voluntary smile. And I hope you can see that following a finger sweep, there's not much difference before and after. In other words, that sign seems to reduce following anastomosis and recovery in part. In case three, another acoustic neuroma of the right, with complete transection of the seventh nerve, Three months later, with no clinical improvement, you see the right side of the mouth is quite paralyzed and down. Whereas post finger sweep, you can see the angle of the mouth is elevated, and you may be able to see that the, the skin is contracting at the edge of the mouth. Here is case four, who had the bilateral seventh nerve paralysis following skull base injury. Pre-sweep, you can see that the mouth is going down both sides because of the seventh nerve pauses. Following the sweep to the left, there's a slight elevation of the mouth. But if we look to the right, you can see that following the sweep on the right, there's a much clearer elevation of the angle of the mouth. In fact, we, did it, we can do it on both sides and show that if you compare this angle of the mouth, sorry, this angle of the mouth here with this one here, that you have a reduced, that, that there's reduced elevation on the right, but that you can activate both at the same time. Uh, and now I've lost where I am because I took the wrong. In this fourth case, a man of 62, he had traumatic sixth and seventh nerve pauses following a skull base injury. Here we see him two months after the accident. Before sweeping, you can see that the angles of both sides of the mouths point downwards. Sweeping to the left produces some elevation of the mouth on that side, but the elevation following sweep is far clearer on the right side here. You can then do both sides together and again show that there's more elevation on the right than there is on the left. But if you compare this slide, with the pre-sweep, there is some elevation on both sides. It doesn't show very clearly here because we screened his eyes, but it's also possible to stretch the forehead muscle, and then you get some contraction too. You might be able to see slight corrugation of frontalis here, but certainly you can see that something's happened because the, the shining of the light above going down onto his scalp has changed, suggesting the scalp has more tension in it. We're now going to show a video which shows stretching both the right and left side of the face. And the important thing is to see the time course of the response. So this video will take several minutes. 
to run. And here is Lorraine Clapham. She's going to stretch the right side of the face first in the proper way. Whilst holding the head because it's quite a forceful stretch. And you can see immediately that the right side of the face elevates. And we're going to follow this because we see the time course of the relaxation of the face as well. And it's beginning to fall slightly now. Now the, the mouth is, has a downward angle on both sides. Now Lorraine will stretch the left side of the face. Twice, slowly, three times, and you can see there's quite a lot of effort involved in this. Immediately, the left side of the face becomes elevated, and there's slight puckering here, showing some contraction of the facial muscles subsequent to the step. It's not seen quite so well on the left, but it's still pleasant. Last of the rain will stretch both sides. And I hope you can see that the sides of the mouth are elevated again slightly more on the right than the left. Then there's a slow relaxation. We thought it wise to preserve some of his anonymity by masking the eyes. That's a slight shame because he shows Bell's phenomena. When he blinks, the eyelids don't move, but the eyes go up in their socket. Okay. When we record from facial muscles using concentric needle EMG during and after the stretch, at rest, EMG showed complete innovation with sparse or absent fibrillation. Here we show some fibrillation. After contraction, there's far more activity with fibrillations increased and these lasted, these discharges lasted for about the same time as the contraction. Once more, I 
just remind you that this is a completely denervated muscle. The pathogenesis of Takum sign is likely to, well, we found that there's a stretch induced contraction which is associated with profuse fibrillation. So this is happening at the level of muscle fibers. And it's likely to be an electrically induced contraction rather than a direct effective stretch on the contractile mechanism itself. In other words, it suggests that the electrical co-contraction mechanism to produce contraction in the muscle is still intact. It doesn't occur immediately after the denervation. It emerges around five to six weeks later and then is present for about five months, after which it fades. This suggests that there might be stretch activated channels in denervated muscle which are upregulated and lead to increased sensitivity to stretch. There's also some evidence that these units might be a small subpopulation of the whole number of muscle fibers, and they remain relatively intact in their electrocontractile mechanism despite being denervated. The clinical significance of the Kaplan sign will now be addressed. If the electrocontractile mechanism is intact in some muscle fibers, even in denervation for several months, then this appears to underpin Kaplan's sign. But remember, we talked about a cramp, and the cramp is painful, whereas Kaplan's sign, when the muscle is contracting, is not. This may be because we do not think that in Kaplan's sign, all those muscle fibers are contracting together, just a small subpopulation of them, maybe. And this may be the reason that the muscle doesn't cramp up in a painful way. The therapists that are aware of this sign in the United Kingdom are using it as a, as a sign of severe axonal generation and that recovery may be slow and associated with synkinesis. But the question is as to whether if you have platform sign and you have an intact electrocontractile mechanism, then you might think that it would be a good thing to get on with anastomosing a nerve to the facial nerve to improve matters before the electrocontractile mechanism uh, it, it, it is, is in some way deactivated with time. But in addition, Clapham sign seems to reduce with re innovation itself, as well as with prolonged denervation. So the loss of Clapham sign, once you've had a re innovation surgery, could reflect that re innovation is going to occur or could reflect in some way degeneration of the muscle with time. It's an open question as to whether stretch induced activation in denervated muscle might improve the muscle contractile mechanism and whether if that was intact, re innovation might be improved. So within a dictionary of neurological signs, the 2016 edition, Atham sign is given as a description of the contraction of the facial muscles observed after the mechanical stretch of the cheek in patients with facial nerve palsy or transection, suggesting preserved activity of the excitation contraction apparatus of facial muscles. And here is Lorraine Clapham having an award, not for this, but for something else, with one of our famous footballers, Gary Lineker, and someone slightly less famous, but he, John Reed was at that time Secretary of State for Health, i.e. the most senior politician involved with health, and so Lorraine had her arm around his neck. Thank you very much. Jonathan, thank you very much. A very interesting observation. So one wonders why this has only been described quite late in uh, 2011. Why did people not pay attention to that earlier? A very good question. It, it depends on how much observation one's doing and how big the stretch is. I think Lorraine, who spent her latter career looking after people with facial, therapy, uh, facial palsy, was pro probably more energetic in her stretch than some maybe. 
Mm -hmm. I, that's pure speculation. I don't know whether right. some people saw it and dismissed it. But we always speculate if you can uh, uh, facilitate re-innovation by, let's say, electric stimulation. But uh, are there any data that you can facilitate re-innovation by repeatedly inducing clapper sign? Uh, th thank you for that question, Walter. No, we don't have data. If one reason to give this as a, a lecture is to suggest that we need to do more studies to see whether the presence of Clapham sign does mean that you should do an anastomosis early while you still have the potential to have an electrocontractile mechanism intact in the muscle. So the muscle does seem to degenerate after about five months and you no longer see Clapham sign. The expectation would be at that point you might have less successful anastomosis. That, but that is purely speculative. We need we need prospective trials. I think the Golgi receptors. I'm not sure if there are any Golgi's in the facial muscle, but if then they should have a very different role to Golgi's in uh, normal extremity muscle. Yeah, the um, the. the, the Classically, facial muscles, as you know, don't contain spindles, um, but there are very there are, there are a large number of Rifbini stretch organs in the skin of the face, which go to the brain through the fifth nerve, and they probably are the, if you like, the peripheral feedback, the position sense of the face, because where, if you if you consider it, the, the facial muscles are a syncytium almost of muscles that join together and move to produce facial expressions and they don't have a clear origin and insertion like mus most muscles do they move together so knowing how long a muscle is is less important than knowing how the face is looking so i think we've evolved to have feedback from Ruffini end organs in the skin rather than a large number of muscle spindles in the facial muscles themselves but having said that, there are data suggesting that there are modified Ruffini end organs in the muscles themselves. So we're also interested in stretching the muscle as well as stretching the skin. And are there more? Did, did, did you now go to uh, peripheral extremity muscles and try to stretch them and do? That's uh, it. Yeah. Would you would expect that denervated skeletal muscles would also show up regulation of stretch sensitive channels these these channels are present in heart muscle they're present in pachina corpuscles they're present in the inner ear their stretch sensitive channels are, are quite widely spread so you'd expect them to be in skeletal muscles too but it ha i haven't been able to show it maybe because the skeletal muscles can't be stretched as much because they have origins and insertions bounded by bone Well, again, this is a very interesting observation. And how how do we facilitate spread of knowledge in that area? Then um, I think we need more empirical data. We need to reproduce this in other places. I mean, there are several places in the United Kingdom aware of Clapham sign, but it would be good if people could reproduce this elsewhere. Um, and we need to be looking at prospective trials if we can get surgeons interested. To say well if you have if you have a completely denervated muscle they ideally as you know you want to wait to see if you have any re innovation but when you've made a surgical transaction and you haven't done a repair as in the, the cases of acoustic neuroma you know there's no recovery going to occur so then you would anticipate doing an anastomosis early then you whilst you can demonstrate clap and sign it would be interesting to see if they do rather better than if you can't. Okay, Jonathan, again, thank you very much. Very interesting observation. And, uh, well, thank you. It's, it's, it's a curious observation. But initially, we questioned whether it was actually the case, but it does seem to be reproducible. And so we need, ideally, to reproduce it amongst the clinical neurophysiology community, hence, hence the lecture. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.